Every time that I go to a libertarian or a Bitcoin or any type of really freedom conference, I start to hear people talking about what they call like a shared community or intentional communities. And there are many reasons why more and more people are considering these to be an advantage and, and are looking at the advantage of, of looking at these shared communities, which are often named things like self-sustainability and communities that are separate from state intervention. Also, they're finding that as resources become scarcer and scarcer and unemployment rates are starting to increase, that these intentional communities such as eco-villages and co-housing projects are becoming much more popular. So today on Renegade News, we're talking about intentional or shared communities, the pros and the cons, and why you may or may not want to get involved in one. Welcome back to Renegade News. I'm your host, Glenn Kowalski. Every week on this channel, we'll discuss the latest news, strategies, and tactics for breaking free from the system, paying less tax, and living anywhere in the world that you want. So let's just dive right on into it. The pros and cons of communal living are really, there's lots of both. I mean, sharing home and resources can save you a lot of money and it can provide you with support and also help you with many other difficulties in life. But there are also some issues with this way of living. So you should do as much research as you can before taking that step, especially if you have a family. So let's look at some of those pros and cons of joining the intentional or shared communities. First of all, what is an intentional community? Well, these communities are formed when people choose to live with or near each other and to carry out a shared style of lifestyle within a shared culture and with a common purpose for the community. These communities can be found all around the world. They're usually rural, but there's plenty of urban ones. There are small ones and there's larger ones. Some of them are progressive, um, others are conservative, others are secular and others are religious. And there's almost an unending variety of the types. There are some that are very alternative lifestyle based. I would say mostly those, but there's some that are actually fairly mainstream as well that are beginning to form. And they're going by many names now, including things like eco villages, co-housing, housing cooperatives, co-living, tiny house villages are really popular. They're also doing some tiny houseboat villages, those kinds of things. So it's growing in popularity, which is also adding to the variety. And unlike a typical retirement community, the residents of these communities usually have a high degree of collective autonomy from the rest of the world. The residents make group decisions about how they live. They decide who can become a member, who can join, how often to share meals, who does the dishes, all of those types of things. Often they use some type of a uh, consensus or some type of a sociocratic process both participatory or non-centralized forms of decision-making. So why are these so popular? Why are people joining these communities? Well, there's people of all walks of life that are starting to do it. And they're joining these communities as a more attractive living option than what normal housing offers, especially as real estate increases in price and homeowners associations are forming that people may not agree with all of the rules and regulations. People want to live in communities where people think similar to what they think. So these communitarians, they often report that they have a greater connectedness, they have better support, more health and safety, and much more enjoyment of life. So while joining or starting one of these international communities isn't always possible or desirable for everyone, the existence of such places shows us how we can move towards a more just, sustainable, and cooperative world if we work together. Now, speaking of international communities, We've created a virtual community for entrepreneurs, professionals, and other freedom lovers who are stepping out of the status quo and they're taking responsibility for their family's personal, financial, and location independence. If you see yourself as a renegade, you know, someone who thinks for themselves and who believes in self-ownership and in self-responsibility, and if you're looking for the latest strategies and tactics from other freedom lovers like you, we'd love to have you join us for free in creating what we're calling the renegade movement. So check out more details in the pinned comment below. Anyway, getting back to these intentional communities, the top reasons that people are choosing to live in these community include things like shared resources, because the community living allows for resource sharing and later living while meeting all of our needs for connection and for belonging. They also give a form of community support. I mean, imagine being in the hospital and people are taking turns staying with you during the day 
driving your spouse to the hospital, helping you sort out the situation with your insurance payments as they're going on. It's sort of like living with a big family, except you got to choose the family. There is somebody in the group who can fix a computer. You know, someone else can fix your car. Someone else can do your tax forms, do massages, babysit. They can help cook dinner when you're broken in your foot. People, you can ask for advice on different topics. And yes, there's always going to be some kind of arguments about, you know, who, who's left to do the dishes in the sink. But then there's always some minor squabbles among people in any group. You also get to pick the rules that you want to live by because these rules and laws are based on the collective purpose and the vision of that community. These intentional or shared communities really allow for a lot of experimentation. And most of them are really in the experimental stage right now. And they become these experimental or experimentation centers for human scale living systems. Things including renewable energy, local food production, alternative governments, uh, models of ecological building and those types of things. As we said earlier, there are different types of international communities. There's things like co-housing, which is probably the fastest growing type of community. And it's a model they originally designed from Denmark, where the residents have their own housing units with many shared services and facilities. Eco villages, on the other hand, focus more on sustainability across social, cultural, economic, and ecological dimensions. There's also housing cooperatives or a housing co-op. And here the members live in housing that they own and govern themselves. These are often things like student groups who have shared housing or unrelated people sharing houses for their mutual benefits. They can also be called co-living or co-working spaces. You're seeing those a lot in the digital nomad communities right now where they have these co-living type of arrangements. There's also and have always been these spiritual and religious communities which are organized around spiritual or religious beliefs. Now, another one that's coming up and it's really hot and popular right now are these tiny house villages. And these are small communities that are comprised of these small, tiny little houses that fit into a tiny little footprint and therefore don't make much ecological footprint and they're much more ecological to build. My sister actually just sent me one today that she was looking at beautiful little place for about $6,000 to build. So these, as real estate prices increase, People who have land are turning them into these little communities. Another type of intentional community or shared living that we've seen for ages is senior communities where you have to be 55 or older or have other age restrictions to join. These are really popular in Florida, for example. There's tons of condominiums being built where you have to be an older and they have community services because everybody in the community are at those ages. There are also commune income sharing communities where work is required of the members. And apparently about 10% of all intentional communities fit into that type of a model, which I was quite surprised about. There's also like the traditional indigenous communities within with have long histories of intentional communities and these communal ways of living. And those have been going on since the beginning of time. And there's more of these sprouting up all the time as activist collectives, Kib Buddhism, artist communities, camp hill communities, agri hoods, retreat centers, ashrams, community land trusts, and permaculture farms that are gaining a whole lot of popularity these days and makes so much sense because of the environmental advantage of them. But like anything else, there are negatives to these types of communities. And no community is not gonna, is gonna exist without a challenge. And a hundred of these communities fail for everyone that succeeds. And most of these intentional shared communities, they collapse within the first couple of years. And that's why we don't see more of them, even though we see so many of them starting. These communities vary so widely in ethos, governance, and functioning. And there has to be rules or people argue, and then they fight, or they refuse to do work a certain way or to share money in the way that they want to. So for example, people can't agree on who will make the rules or how to interpret these exactly, or how to enforce them, or what to do if somebody breaks them. A problem we see in society all the time amplified in these small communities and that's why they can fall apart. Also communities that don't have clear rules or where the collective purpose is absent, that leads to more interpersonal conflict between the members and that needs to be resolved. Like whose turn is it to do the dishes? Something we've talked about earlier. Did everybody pay into the utility fund this month because it's running a little bit short? Is anybody watching those kids that are playing by the wood pile out back? Did somebody cook meat in this walk? Most intentional communities will collapse within two years, like I said earlier. However, those that are still going after five years are really likely to continue forever. And the world's largest lasting intentional community is a shaker community 
called Sabbath Day Lake in New York State, which is formed in the 1783 and is still in operation. So these can go on if you have the right shared purpose and the right members in it. Intentional communities come with a number of advantages as well as things that you really need to watch out for before you get involved. But in the years that we're facing and we're heading into right now, having the right connections to this community, it's gonna be vital, whether it's formally through one of these communities or informally. So you really need to surround yourself with others who share the same values as you do if you hope to survive what's coming. But you also need strategies like cryptocurrency, self-sufficiency, internationalization, and so many more. So be sure to subscribe to Renegade News right now for the latest tips and strategies for finding more freedom in this unfree world. And check out the video that you see on the screen right now for the latest videos on the best places to live, other communities, crypto, and so much more. I'm Glenn Kowalski from Renegade News, and I'll see you over there.